We are at the home of Frank and Robbie Fuller. They are beekeepers here in Rogersville, Alabama. Um, we are also here with Greg Crenshaw, who Frank has mentored for uh, several years. Greg is going to teach us uh, uh, about bees and beehives, and uh, Frank is going to share his knowledge that he has gained with over 50 years of beekeeping. My name is Greg Crenshaw. I live in Florence, Alabama. Uh, Frank Fuller, like we mentioned, is my mentor and uh, bought several hives from him to get started. 11 hives that were really full of bees and uh, got me a good jump start. I have close to 70 hives now, and uh, which is probably too many for one person to do with no staff or no uh, building or shed to store it in. But uh, anyway, it's a lot of fun and it's a great hobby. And uh, if you have, feel the need to take care of some things like why do people buy horses why do people have pets same kind of thing you know it's you're doing good for the environment there's there is a benefit the pollinators have for gardens and fruit trees and other things and all of uh, at least a third of the things that we eat have been pollinated by pollinators and bees honeybees are one of about 80 pollinators that we have uh, in Alabama at least, so uh, probably more. So I was surprised at that, but they're a lot of fun and it's a challenge. Uh, you know, you might get stung. If you wear the proper clothing, you probably don't get stung, but uh, uh, it is fun. And so let's talk about uh, some things you can do even uh, as a hobbyist. You don't have to have 70 hives. One or two is plenty. Um, and you can do your part if you decide we can help you get started. These are the type of things that you'll need. This is a full hive. Uh, this is a 10 frames go inside here. Uh, there's a bottom board is a separate piece. This, this box is a deep brood chamber, which has 10 frames, about the size of a file folder. And this is a super, which is uh, where the bees, once they get established in a large enough population to bring in excess nectar to make honey to store it in. They typically store honey above the brood chamber, even in a, a near the door in a, a another, another environment or like in a tree, let's say a tree cavity, and they move up into that in the winter. When it's below 50 degrees, they cluster together and uh, move up one millimeter a day into the honey that they've stored. So uh, if there's a good nectar flow, and our nectar flow primarily in Alabama is early, April, April 1st to, to June. And uh, then it tapers off into a dearth, which means there's a lack of uh, things to collect nectar. And so uh, people ask, well, how, how can we as gardeners help uh, beekeepers? Well, not just by planting things that bloom in the spring along with everything else, but about the best thing I've heard is if you could plant plants like uh, Rows of Sharon and other things that bloom in the, when not very many other things are blooming, that's how you can help bees to, to make the dearth where it's not so um, empty of, of blooms and things like that. So uh, there may be things blooming, but maybe not in the, in the reach of these bees. So uh, you see them going down the highway, there's locusts blooming, there's uh, right now we have, it's mid-June and we have, um, um, what's the plant we were talking about, pink bloom? Mimosa. Mimosa. Now that's a good pollen source and I think they get some nectar from that as well, but um, it's, it, there may not be any within two miles of this hive. So anyway, so people ask what can they do? Plant plants that bloom in the midsummer, like from June to August. All right, now let's get into a hive. Uh, between these two layers, well let's, this is the top. This is the telescoping cover, which is nice, has a metal top. Sheds the water. You want to have all your wood painted or stained or uh, so it's waterproof. Now the inside, which is exposed to bees, is usually not painted. All right, this is the inner cover, which helps give a little ventilation. And uh, they, you can tell where they've started to build a little bit on here. So um, in their spare time. All right, this is the honey super. Uh, this has 10 frames in it as well. And uh, when they fill this up, these are the things that we take off as extra surplus honey. They still have honey down below. And oftentimes, you, as a beekeeper, you decide how much honey you want to leave on them for the winter. In Alabama, in this area, we need 40 to 60 pounds of honey. To they need it to make it through the winter, usually, is enough. 
So um, we would usually leave them with a deep and a super, one super to make it through the winter. Anything above that, you see tall hives, well, they've filled each one of these up as the season goes on through April and May. And they just, if you have a really good pollen source like a field of canola or um, clover, there's lots of things that they get it from. Uh, tulip poplar trees are very good uh, nectar producers. Tupelo honey from Mississippi. Uh, you've heard of sourwood, which is notable. We have sourwood here in Alabama, however, they, we may not have a microclimate like the Smoky Mountains in North Georgia and North Carolina to make it their favorite. So uh, it may not, and they always go to their favorite. You can have your tomato plants here and your squash and your beans and your watermelon. They may fly right past that if the honeysuckle is blooming or the uh, uh, crepe myrtle, no, crepe, not crepe myrtle, um, uh, privet hedge. Privet hedge is one of their favorites. It smells really sweet. And a matter of fact, I mentioned honeysuckle, but they can't really use honeysuckle because the stem, the stem is too deep. Their tongue is only so long and they haven't really figured out like bumblebees that you can come from the side. So they will use privet more than they'll use honeysuckle, for instance, So which is surprising to me. All right, so let's take this super off. We've got this honey. When it's full, it's roughly 60 pounds of honey. And honey is very heavy. And uh, so these boxes do pile up to quite a bit. So you want a good foundation up under there, usually concrete blocks with boards or something like that, or just concrete blocks. They say if skunks are in the area, they have a tendency to predate uh, bees. They'll come and beat on the bottom board right here and the bees come out at night. And it's like, hey, who is that out there? And the skunks just readily eat them right off the front board. So if you have them up 16 inches, that's taller than a skunk. A skunk can reach about 14 inches. So if you have, uh, if you're known for skunks, that's one way to help keep them from just eating all your bees. You know, wonder why your bees are getting less and less in number. The skunk comes by every night and they come out and he eats them up. So, all right. Um, I don't know about what to do for bears besides put a wire fence around it. So, all right, so this particular device here is a queen excluder. This, when we have the queen down here, we want her to, to lay eggs and, and create more bees down below in the brood chamber versus in the honey. So we, when, we, when we spin or, or uh, extract honey, uh, we don't want there to be babies in there fixing to be hatched. So um, this is the device we use to do that, and somebody's figured out the exact uh, distance between these bars to where bees can get through easily and uh, carry honey without the queen being able to get through. Queen, after she's made it, her body is large and she won't be able to get through here. So we we know that, you know, oftentimes you're looking for the queen to see what kind of condition she's in or if she's laying. And so we know that she's not above the queen excluder. All right. So down below we have the brood chamber. These are full frames, or we'll call deep frames, and this is foundation has not been drawn out with comb yet. Uh, drawn comb is one of your uh, greatest, uh, yeah, this one's just all foundation, so uh, one of your greatest resources because this frame versus one that's drawn out, all the bees have to do on one that's drawn out is use it. You know, they'll, if they want to store honey, they can start filling it. If they want to, if the queen needs a place to lay, she can lay in it immediately as opposed to waiting for her colony to, to draw this out. And this is imprinted with the hexagon pattern of the bees and so they'll readily draw this out. And this is a wax, piece of wax that's been pressed into shape. And uh, this is our starting foundation for this particular hive. So there, where, where, where do you get bees from? You can buy them in packages with, uh, some states have, like Alabama, you cannot transfer bees into the state on comb. They're thinking comb carries um, diseases and things like that. And they've traced lots of chemicals, even DDT, you can take some comb. Somehow DD, traces of DDT and other per, perquat and some other chemicals which have been sprayed, not been sprayed since the 70s are still found in comb. So it's somewhere still out there being recycled by plants and make it up to the flowers. So that's was surprising to me. And there was a list of like 40 different uh, things. So, so Alabama has a law. So how do you get bees if you don't have them on comb? Well, you can buy them by themselves in three pound cluster uh, with a queen. So they shake bees, large producers in the Southern states. 
produce a lot of bees. They shake them into a box, they scoop out a scoop, they put them in a, on a scale, they give you three pounds of bees, which is about this many, and uh, a queen. They pull a queen from a queen from a hive, she's using a little container, she puts them in there, they come in a screen, they mail it, put them right in the mail. Mail them to you, the post office pretty good about, hey, uh, come get these bees, you got some bees, and so they're all scared usually, so, um, and they do just fine. And they've been doing that for years, so. All right, so that's a package of bees, or you could buy some locally from a person like Frank that has established beehives. So, um, and a pack, and a, a nucleus, which is a five-frame colony, which would be half this size, would be in the $150 to $200 range, just for the frames with the bees and the uh, established queen and such like that. So, um, multiple ways to get that, and there's. Um, I'm a member of the Northwest Alabama uh, beekeepers, and so we um, oftentimes have members that have surplus bees for sale at all times of the year. So, all right, uh, back to this. Uh, so we have an established hive, and once you have five frames of bees, you, and they can start growing and bringing in resources, nectar and pollen, uh, they need more space. If they don't have more space, they'll swarm, and half the hive will go somewhere else. So we give them this box, which has 10 frames up from a five frame. We give them three more frames or five more frames of empty foundation and they expand into this box. And by in, you know, some point, if they're ready to start collect, they have the bottom full. And so we start time to start, uh, you know, building them up and let them start storing excess honey. And so uh, off we go and Put them back together and they're really good at taking care of themselves. All right, we can talk a little bit about uh, the pests of bees. Uh, there's the Varroa mite, which is a very small mite that rides on the back, attaches itself to the bee and uh, sucks the juices out of it. And uh, they do carry diseases. It's like mosquitoes. A mosquito bite to a human is not that much problem, but they carry malaria and could be several other things that. Uh, they can transmit through that way. So that's the same way a mite affects a bee, and they can get overrun. The ways might, way might, mites produce is they go into the brood right before it's capped. So one mite goes in, 16 come out. So um, we do have to treat for varroa mites. They came around about the 90s, uh, probably from Asia, I believe. So uh, we, we, treatment of those is a regular thing now. So. Um, uh, there's also uh, wax moss and small high beetles. Small high beetles looks like a black ladybug, and they get in there and they they like uh, you know their goal is to reproduce a family and and uh, and feed themselves as well. So they feed on the nectar and the uh, pollen that the bees have produced as well. And so they wreck the hive. They go sideways through the honey, and so if honey starts running out of your hive, that could be a small hive beetle infestation. So normally if there's enough bee volume inside the hive, they keep them from laying eggs. So they keep them at bay, but there could come a point where they, uh, if there's not enough bees or ha half of them swarm out and you've got all this space on here that they can't really police properly, uh, the small hive beetles will get in and, and start keeping hunt house up here and they produce a yeast this call it makes a shiny layer of slime. It's called sliming, and uh, the smell repels the bees. So the bees, you know, start moving away, or they come out of the hive and start hanging out on the outside because it stinks. And it's like skunk getting in the house, you know. So it'll eventually run you out of the house. So which is what they want. So that's a bad thing that we. Uh, there's several several ways to trap those small hive beetles. And uh, I think the original place I've seen them, they came from Florida about the same early 2000s or something like that. And um, so now they're nationwide. And up into the northern regions where there's very few, but mostly in the southern regions. And I think they live in, uh, when a tree dies, they live between the bark and the cambium. So it's, um, I'm not sure where their normal habitat is, but they love bees and beehives because that's, uh, a great place for them to live and reproduce. Next we have hive or um, uh, wax moths. All right, if uh, this is the normal life cycle, and I'm not sure how long they've been here, but it looks like other moths, but these particularly 
prefer wax. We've heard of wax moths. I used to fish with them as a bait. And so they come in and uh, decimate the hive. They live on the wax and the other resources. These guys, these are active right here. There's a worm right there. This is what you would fish with. Great brim bait, panfish. So they just wreck all the, the, the cavities that the bees have made. And so you can tell by the webbing. So they're in there. So this one is discovered today. The bees have moved out the wax moth. So if the bees are um, in a cavity in a tree for say, and they one of two things uh, runs them off or they die out because of aurora mites or any other natural causes, very rarely do they die from winter. They, they're very adept at cold weather. And uh, as long as they have food, they can make it pretty easy. There's a bee came and he smelled the smell. And it smells really good like wax still. And that's the same thing that the wax moth keys in on. They are very adept at finding ab abandoned beehives. So say for instance, we're in a tree and the uh, bees are gone. So the wax moths come in and uh, do, you know, completely eat all the wax and stuff in a hive and it drops to the bottom of the cavity in the tree. Well, then next spring when it's time for bees that have uh, expanded too much and so it's time swarm season, now they have an open place to to come and move in and it already smells like wax. So it's a uh, very attractive to them to move into that new spot that's been decimated. The wax moths have grown, they've produced their young and, and uh, uh, you know, moved on. So that's a great place for bees to, to move back into. So that's kind of the life cycle. And as a beekeeper, you really don't want this, but um, and there's ways to prevent that. And it's usually caused by neglect. So, um, Kind of like a garden, you know. If you go two weeks without weeding or something like that, then uh, uh, you know what you're looking into. So, um, well, that's it about predators. That's not a, you know, doesn't cover all the microscopic things, but uh, these are the three main things that we look for. And the main uh, remedy for that is going in your hives weekly or bi weekly uh, to check on them. Make sure the queen is laying. There's some guys that are coming to. Frank has 20 hives out here, so it's not uncommon to be working out here. And the bees are all, the foragers are out looking for something to eat, so uh, they smell the honey and um, and the wax, and they come to check us out. And here we are. We're going to have an actual hive inspection. Some of the things we look for in a hive. Uh, this hive was a swarm caught in the spring. And uh, swarms are usually good at building up quickly because they they fill up with honey before they leave the original hive, and uh, they know first thing they're going to need to do is build comb. So uh, if they go to the new place, so they all drink a bunch of honey, and off they go. And so they uh, find, they settle on a tree or something like that, and a beekeeper people call they don't know what to do with it. They call a beekeeper. We come out there and we put them in a box and give them a new place to live and a good home and treat them for mites and uh, give them good health, free health care and a uh, free place to live and uh, in hopes of getting a uh, harvest of honey off of them. We use a smoker. Uh, it's a traditional thing that helps, uh, people say it helps settle them or, or calm the bees, but uh, um, so anyway, we do use that. So let's get into this hive. We take the top cover off. Underneath the top cover, we have a few ants. The bees, uh, they have a caulk, which we call propolis, which is uh, antibacterial, antimicrobial. These bees, so these ants that are here are not really a problem. They're just looking for a place to live. So uh, we'll probably just brush them off. Got it, got it. So we have some bees on the inside here. It's all unlikely, but the uh, bees could have, the queen could be up here. So we always look for the queen on the inner cover, just in case. This is often time where you first see uh, mites. I mean, not mites, but uh, high beetles. We don't see any right now. That's good. We'll just set that over here gently. 
We look into the hive and all right, they're very calm. They're not flying up in our face. Uh, they're busy. We, we count seams of bees. You can see that little bee well, he was doing a waggle dance, showing others where he found something to eat. So they're just working, working, working. The hive is kind of quiet, so we know a queen is in there. Usually they're much calmer when there's a queen present. So this is, uh, I'll pull a couple of frames. You always want to work from the outside so you don't squish bees. You're going to go down to the bottom. Uh, probably. You just lift that super off there. I'm going to show them. All right, once the bee, we talked about this previously, but uh, once uh, there's a large enough workforce to get uh, to start produce, to get excess honey, when if there's a, a nectar flow on, like in May and April, um, we give them a super, which is designed specifically for honey. We got a, we don't have a queen excluder, but anyway, there, this is where they would store the honey, excess honey that they would usually have over winter. We usually leave them one box of this to make it through the winter. This one's kind of stuck. So this looks really good. All right, this is capped honey. When they reduce the uh, moisture content in nectar to, uh, to 18%, less than 18% humidity, then, um, uh, then they cap it. And then it'll keep for thousands of years because bacteria doesn't grow and so we've rolled a few of those bees so that's what you're trying to prevent by starting on the end so you don't do your queen that way and so they've built this out pretty thick and so in order to harvest this we scrape off that cap because it's like slinging something out of a jar if you don't take the lid off nothing's coming out so we had to take this cap off and then put it in a centrifuge and spin the hive all right, so this is virtually completely capped all the way up. So this is an indication if the outside frame is completely capped, we're ready for a new super. Meaning, which is this this whole box, more frames ready for them to... Uh, we'll, set, we'll set that up there. Give them some warm at all. all right, gonna, this is all we need to look at in this box right here. And then we'll put this back on top. You can set that right here on this when you get ready. Okay. So we take this tool and we have to pry the boxes apart because they've sealed it with their propolis, which is the same as caulk. We take that off and now we can look in to the others. Okay, so we this is what we consider the brood chamber, meaning where they... Uh, um, have babies and the queen is rearing more and more bees all right so i'm going to take this edge frame out smoke that side over a little bit before we do that the smoke one of the things we do with the smoke is to it helps run the bees down in there a little bit similar to how it affects people you put smoke in their eyes they go the other what direction so we're starting the end as well we pull this frame out we expect to have, this is where they normally store resources, so we should expect to see honey. So there's capped honey. And some other frames that aren't quite capped yet. The queen is unlikely to be on this outside frame, although she could be. We have some frames, see the glistening of the honey in there? So that's, uh, that's nectar that they're piling in there. And they don't fill one cell and cap it, fill one cell and cap it, because they have to dry all of it at the same time. So at any one time in the hive, there's a draft going that they're drying, they're using to dry this nectar down to make it thicker so they can cap it. And so it keeps for longer. Okay, so these guys are busy. They're storing and drying and things like that. All right, so I'm going to move quickly so we don't leave this hive open very long to disturb them. All right, we're getting closer to brood. There's, this is about the same. Some honey capped on the outside corner. Normally this is where we would find brood. In the past month or so, this has been full of new babies or what we call brood. All right, there's some queen cups that are ready for a queen cell when the time it comes to, uh, to make, to, to go. And they have, a, that's a shallow cup. Queens are raised in a vertical position Unlike all the others, the workers and the drones are uh, uh, raised in a horizontal fashion. 
in those frames there. So uh, when it when they become crowded, they will uh, use they'll lay the queen will lay an egg in that queen cup, and it become they start feeding it. And that becomes a new queen eventually. All right, this is a good frame. Shows we have some capped brood here, which are new babies that are ready to hatch. All right, and down in there, I don't think we I don't see any larva. But normally the queen will start laying. This is a sign of a queen that she's been there within the last 10 days that we have this cat brood. I don't see her on this frame. I'm not sure if she's marked or not. We'll keep an eye open for her. Probably not. So, um, all right, a little bit more cat brood. You might can see down in here, these have larvae in them. A little white worm that, uh, you, that's what, um, it's just not in large enough to be capped yet. Okay, let's keep going quickly. We have to pry these apart, ease them out. By taking that first frame out, we've made lots of room so we don't have to brush any of the bees off as we pull them out. Pull them out very gently. This looks like a uh, cell where a queen has come previously on this frame. It's an old site. So it's probably hasn't been recent. All right, so this is a great frame with lots of brood. This is a good laying queen right here. She has a whole frame side covered and that's thousands of new bees that'll be coming. It's likely we could run across the queen here. I didn't put my glasses on, but we'll just do our best to find her. And there's a great example of uh, lots of brood, good brood pattern. This means we have a healthy queen and there could be some eggs and larvae out here. If we see eggs, that means the queen has been there within four days. So, um, all right. All right, the queen won't have her head down in the cell checking it out for long. She'll be walking around most likely. Uh, they do like to hide, so that little area right here, they can hide in there. We don't necessarily need to see the queen to know how good she's doing. We see, if you can see right here, this is a good example of larva down inside the hive. The, those white worms that haven't been capped yet. So that as they work their way outwards, uh, they get younger and younger. All right. So that should be a good close-up. And uh, it's going to be virtually impossible to see eggs. But this right here, you can tell, is, is uh, pollen, which is their protein source. And this, they're storing some more honey for the, uh, to just have on hand nearby as the babies need to be fed. I don't know if they make a sound or if they make a smell, a pheromone smell that says, feed me, feed me. But just like a mother and her child, she knows when the baby needs something to eat. So as nurse bees uh, first emerge, their job in the hive is... Uh, to feed these larvae since they can't fly. But as they get older, their jobs change to carrying water, going uh, foraging for nectar, etc. And, uh, and even defense of the hive. So we'll go real quick. Hopefully we can get through this in the next two minutes. As we approach the center of the hive, we're likely to see the queen. She, the majority of the brood nest is usually in the middle. That's the queen right here, yeah, right, there. right there on the end. Yeah. Yeah. She turned the corner just yeah. now on us. Watch there she is. I'll watch. There she is. Her body's a little bit longer. She has a lifetime supply of uh, sperm and eggs inside. She has a uh, organ called the spermatheca, which allows her to lay one egg and one sperm together in each cell. So we're going to ease her back in there. We don't need to go any further. We've already seen lots of examples of her laying. And so we're going to ease these back together. Make sure we don't kill her. And then we're done. So this is a high, thriving hive. they got a, repl a constant replacement of uh, new bees. Summer bees last about four to six weeks, and winter bees, which don't fly nearly as much, last four to six months. So, um, 
all the things we do, we try to prevent killing bees, you know, up on the edges. So if, if we were covered with bees here, we would smoke them down. You can see how that makes them kind of run just a little bit. You can kill a lot of bees in a quick time if you just pop the top right back on. And so this is about 55, 65 pounds. This uh, super right here. So it's virtually full of honey. So now would be a good time to put another one on. We got that. We have found some bees here that need to get back home. We had a high be able to show you, but we don't. That's good. All right, and that's our complete inspection. We'll put this back on. We call this the mezzanine. Turn you it know, over. Turn it over. Up on the roof. Turn it over. Yep. Throw this too. Right here. Cinnamon. Cinnamon is one thing you can put on top. It uh, doesn't bother the bees, the ants. It helps with. Uh, Ants don't like it. So hopefully that will prevent another colony of ants from moving in. And then we put the top back on. Alright, so we check for the queen. Uh, a queen right hive is a hive that uh, has a laying queen that she's healthy. Uh, she's running the orchestrating the hive properly and um, uh, lots of new bees are being made and uh, to replace the ones that are dying from attrition and so we have a full super of honey uh, there we need to give them more space but if we don't give them more space they have a tendency to swarm so when they're crowded in their environment and resources are still coming in uh, there's a situation called backfilling which means when the queen, as the babies are hatch out of the cell the workers bring more uh, resources or nectar or pollen and fill that cell that had a baby in it and then it's no longer available to lay eggs in for the queen so um, that would make be one of the reasons the queen would lay an egg in a cell to swarm so uh, so we're out of space so by giving them more space to, to store nectar and pot you know which they turn into honey by drying it then uh, that leaves the bottom layer for brood rearing and uh, more bees so I hope you've learned a lot and uh, it's very interesting. You can have three PhDs and still not know everything you need to know. Uh, there's, uh, this is just a beginner course and uh, as you start uh, getting into it, um, there's things that oftentimes if they do go queenless or I kill the queen by mistake, we need to introduce a queen and there's lots of things to do to do that because they may not accept her right off the bat. So um, anyway, hope that helps. Hope you liked it, enjoyed it.